the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. <clears throat> we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. The Lord be with you. And, also with you. and let us pray. O oh God, you are gracious and compassionate to all your people, and in our time you fulfill your plans for us. Grant us to wait patiently for your will to be done. By your Holy Spirit, fill us with hope and peace as we await the fulfillment of your promises in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading for today is from Lamentations chapter 3. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. For men are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. This is the word of our Lord. And then the epistle reading from Romans chapter 8. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is the word of our Lord. And then the Holy Gospel for today from Mark chapter 5. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter's dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, 
if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the crowd. You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of our Lord. And now would you please, as we say together, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the next hymn. If you're following along in the hymnal, notice that we're skipping verses 4 and 5.
grace to you and peace from God our Father, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. In case you did not catch the key word for today, see if you pick up now. In the intro at wait for the Lord and keep his way. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. In the colic for the day, we prayed, grant us to wait patiently for your will to be done. In the Old Testament reading, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The epistle reading, Romans chapter 8, said the whole creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. And it also says we ourselves wait eagerly for our adoption as sons. And then in the gospel reading for today, while the word wait was not there, we had a wonderful story of waiting for the Lord. Waiting for the Lord, what does that all mean? That's our topic for today. Let's think about, first of all, Jairus and how he had to wait. Jairus, he was the synagogue ruler in Capernaum and he had a daughter who was 12 years old who was deathly, deathly ill. So much so that he truly believed that death was imminent, and indeed he was correct. There was nothing else that could be done for her from a human point of view, and yet he had heard about this man, Jesus. In fact, Jesus, prior to this, had done numerous miracles right there in the streets of Capernaum, including many, many healings. And so Jesus came from across the sea. We had that story last week and the storm on the sea and everything else like that. Well, in the morning, there they were on the beach. And the crowd heard about it, the crowd of the citizens of Capernaum, and they immediately swarmed around him. A huge crowd, all wanting, shall we just say, a piece of him. They had some kind of request, some kind of need, some kind of ailment. They wanted him to help. And then there was Jairus, and it was critical. This girl was dying. This had to be addressed immediately, and yet the circumstances forced Jairus to wait. To wait. He had to make his way through the crowd, and each of them thought that their needs were most significant of all. And yet, maybe because he was the synagogue ruler and perhaps treated with a little bit of deference, he somehow got to the front and got to Jesus, and he fell down on his knees and begged him, Lord, my daughter's dying. Come and help her. And Jesus said he would. Sounded good. The waiting was over. Jesus was on his way, right? No, there was still more waiting. Because in the meantime, the crowds kept pressing around him, and Jesus isn't able to walk very fast through that crowd. And then you have that whole incident with the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. She was one of those who was in that crowd and wanted help, needed help. And she did that whole thing with touching Jesus' clothes. And that slowed up everything. Boy, did that slow it up. Jesus felt power had left his body. So then Jesus stopped. Jairus is standing there. Jesus, what are you doing? Why did you stop? And then he starts looking around, looking around at the crowd and says, who touched my clothes? And then the disciples even got the point. Jesus, you know, if they were doing it today, they'd say, give me a break. Give me a break, Jesus. Look at this crowd. They're all pressing around you, and you ask, who touched your clothes? Maybe they themselves were just thinking about the, 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 the dynamics of the whole situation, but maybe they were understanding Jairus, who was right there, And wondering, why was Jesus stopping? But Jesus kept on. What happened? What happened? Where? Who? What? Come come on. 
And for a while, I'm sure that woman, because it says that she was petrified, I'm sure for a few moments at least, she didn't say a word until she finally got her courage up. And then she told her story to Jesus. And in the meantime, Jairus is standing there. I don't know exactly what was going through his mind, but could it possibly have been? Um, Let's see, this woman's been bleeding for 12 years. That's as long as my daughter has been alive, and she's about to die. If it takes her one more hour before any of this gets cleared up, that's fine. Let's go, Jesus. He loved his daughter. He wanted her healed. And then Jesus spent all the time talking with her until finally, until finally Jesus goes, except that word comes, it's too late. Your daughter is dead. Undoubtedly, grief overwhelmed Jairus, just as it would for anyone who would have to experience the death of such a young child. But I do wonder if there was maybe just a little bit of anger. If he didn't have to wait. If Jesus, if you had answered right away, none of this would have happened. But then, Jesus very calmly looked at Jairus and comforted his soul and said, don't be afraid. Just believe. And now that gets to our point. The point of all this, wait for the Lord stuff. It's all over the scripture. I already read the passages that we read this morning from Old Testament, from the epistles. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. What does that all mean? What does God intend for us to do when we wait for the Lord? As I was preparing for the sermon, I came across an article which was entitled, What Does It Mean to Wait on the Lord? And I thought they had a couple of pretty decent points here, so I want to kind of use this as, our, as a little uh, outline for the next couple of minutes. I thought this was insightful, and I think it's exactly, exactly what the Scripture's talking about. When we all are encouraged to wait on the Lord says this, waiting on the Lord necessitates two, two key elements. One, a complete dependence on God. Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a second. But this first one, and a willingness to allow God to decide the terms, including the timing of his plan. There's an interesting thing that's going on right here. It's saying very specifically that waiting is more than just the passage of time. More than just the passage of time. You and I don't think like that. When we think about waiting, we think very specifically about time just marching on and probably being frustrated because we don't like to wait. We hate waiting. Waiting is not in the psyche of American citizens. Not at all. We don't like to wait too long at a red light, for crying out loud. We get frustrated. How come that thing doesn't turn? We don't like to wait in the line at a grocery store. That's why Fairway does as good a job as they do. Whenever they see one person waiting in line, they get another checker up there. They know how people feel about that whole deal. Waiting is not our specialty. That's why Mayo Clinic drives us nuts. (laughs) 
right? You know very well the time they want you there, it's just so you can wait until they feel like getting around to you. We think waiting is all about timing. But God says, no, 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 no. There is a dimension of time, of course, because as people of the world, you are in time. So time always passes. But the real key thing about waiting is about taking trust in the Lord. Waiting on the Lord necessitates two key elements, a continued dependence on God and a willingness to allow him to decide the terms, including the timing of his plan. Trusting God with the timing of events is one of the hardest things to do. The half-joking prayer, Lord, I need patience, and I want it right now, is not far removed from the truth of how we often approach matters of the Lord's will. We want God to answer, and we want him to answer when? Now. Now. Because that's how we are. Waiting on the Lord, however, is about holding on tight, holding with expectation and trust, knowing that our Lord is not making us wait just to see how long we can take it, but there, excuse me, that's how long we can take it. There are times when God will delay his answer, and at times we wonder why he seems so reluctant to intervene in our affairs. Jairus. David himself, King David, wrote in Psalm 69, verse 3, I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking to my God. It's been so long, God. I've been praying, I've been praying, I've been praying, I've been waiting, I've been waiting, I've been waiting, and yet you don't seem to answer. But knowing the Lord, or as knowing who he is, what he's done for us, what he's like, knowing the Lord, we trust that he will come at the perfect moment. Not a second too soon, not a second too late. That's a cool sentence. And I don't know if there's too many of us here that would say, amen. Rather, we'd probably say, Lord, help us to be able to do that. Trusting God so much, knowing who he is, what he has done for us, how much he cares for us, we know that he will answer at the right moment, at the right time. Fundamental to being able to wait is trusting God's character and goodness, which also means, here's where it gets tough, which also means that we cease following our own agenda. We cease following our own ingenuity, our own power, and our own strength. The problem is we like to think of ourselves as self-sufficient. That we can handle situations and we can make plans that are the right plans. But the Lord wants us to trust and to depend on him. You see, this is where it really hits the road, right? It's nice to say we can wait for the Lord because of all that he's done for us and we know that he loves us. He gave his son to die for us. We can put our hands in in his and we know he's going to live and bless us wondrously. Comes across the tongue kind of easily. But then the reality comes that in our selfish, sinful human natures, we like to trust in ourselves. And we think we know what is best. And if God isn't doing what we think best, do we continue to wait? Do we continue to say, well, maybe I don't know what is best. God does know what is best, therefore I'll just let him take his time. Or do we get mad at God? 
Or do we get disappointed in God? Do we get frustrated with his lack of response? You see, this is all that thing about waiting. A willingness to humble ourselves and to exalt God and allow his will to be done. Many times we're not there. We want our will. That's exactly what happened with Abraham and Sarah. Remember Abraham and Sarah? God promised them you're going to have a child. And they're getting old. They're getting very old. And for a long time they're waiting. And they're trusting. They're doing well. But then after a little bit of time, they begin to think, Hmm, this doesn't seem to be working. I've got another plan. Let's help God along, Sarah says. Sarah says, I'm past childbearing years, Abraham. Why don't you take my handmaiden and have a child by her? Oh, that sounded so wonderful. It was in accord with God's plan that Abraham would have a son. But it wasn't God's plan. And it wasn't God's timing. And so they set out on their own. No longer waiting, no longer trusting, but now acting in their own sinful way. And it was indeed a sinful way. Abraham had a child by Hagar. Remember what his name was? Ishmael. Later on, God fulfilled his promise. About 12 years or so later, God fulfilled his promise. And Isaac was born. Isaac, the child of the promise, in God's time, in the very moment that it was supposed to happen. But now, because Abraham and Sarah and Hagar really messed things up, what were the consequences? Do you remember? How well did Isaac and Ishmael get along? How well did Sarah and Hagar get along? How well do the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac get along even to this day. You know what I'm talking about? The descendants of Isaac, Jewish people. Descendants of Ishmael, Arabs. Well, thank you very much, Abraham and Sarah. You weren't willing to wait on the Lord. You figured out that you had it all in hand. See, trusting is waiting and waiting for God to do his will without our interference. There's one more example I want to tell you about this whole deal. And that was about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, at one time, had to learn, very specifically, to wait for the Lord. To trust him, even in very difficult circumstances, when it seemed like God wasn't answering. You know, God had blessed Abraham, excuse me, Paul very, very significantly. As a missionary, he had incredible things that were accomplished by his preaching of God's word. Yes, he suffered a great deal. There were, there were terrible beatings and imprisonments and everything else that went along with, with his ministry. But God also blessed him greatly. In fact, there was one time Paul talked about the visions that God gave to him. The visions of heaven. The likes of which no human being on earth, except for the apostle John, has ever seen. Glorious things that were so hard to even talk about that Paul didn't even know how to express it in human language. He had been privileged by God to see the, fit, the end, the goal, the final result of all that he was living for and all that he was proclaiming. But shortly after he had seen those visions, he got this thorn in the flesh. We don't even know specifically what the thorn in the flesh was, but obviously it was some kind of hurt, some kind of pain in his body, whatever it might have been. And it was painful, and it hurt him as such. And so he waited for the Lord. 
in the sense that he prayed, he entrusted, he was confident that God would indeed bless him. Now, he at first thought the blessing is going to be removing this problem, taking away this pain. But that wasn't God's answer. God revealed to Paul, no, I'm not going to take that away from you. Because I want you to remember, very specifically, your sinful human nature. That you indeed have inherited a sin, a sinful nature from your parents that brings to you mortality. And the end result of that is going to be death. And only when you remember that and understand that so wonderfully are the glories that have been revealed to you going to be the most significant. And then Paul began to think. And he said, yes. That makes sense. I will endure this pain as a constant reminder of my sin and the reason why this gospel is here and why heaven lies just ahead. Paul gave up his idea of what would be best and he let God tell him what was best. Paul gave up the idea that in a certain amount of time, things have to change. And he understood that God's timing, a timing of eternity, is always the best. And so Paul learned to wait on the Lord. And it didn't have anything to do with timing. And it didn't even have anything to do with getting the results that he, Paul, wanted. It was indeed casting himself completely upon the Lord and trusting in him to do what was best. To do what was best in the time frame that God wanted to do. This then takes us back to Jairus. The picture I painted before of Jairus may have been correct. I don't know what was going through Jairus' mind. But the picture I painted of Jairus as a man who was impatient with having to wait, with a man who was maybe frustrated that things didn't happen quicker, that one kind of resonates because of who we are. But maybe that's completely wrong. Maybe Jairus was such a man of faith and confidence and trust in Jesus that even though his daughter was dying, he was willing to wait on the Lord. Maybe he wasn't impatient at all. Maybe he was genuinely happy that that woman who had been bleeding for 12 years had gotten a miracle. That, I know, is exactly what Jesus wanted him to learn. Because when news came about his daughter's death, Jesus' words to him were words of waiting. Don't be afraid, just believe. Maybe that was Jairus. If so, he's a man that we should look up to, a man we should be emulating. But it's not about Jairus, is it? It's about that Jesus who was there in Capernaum that particular day. The same Jesus who's here in Stuartville today. Loving each of us, caring for each of us, telling us, don't be afraid, 
Just believe. And then we, his faithful people, his faithful people, truly and biblically waiting for the Lord. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers today, we're going to say a prayer for Marlis Rosine. Marlis has moved to Baldwin, Wisconsin. Uh, she has a daughter that lives over there, uh, and she is going to be near to her right now. And she actually moved with her son, Bob. Uh, Bob has built a house uh, over there, and he'll be, uh, they're going to be moving in on Tuesday. Uh, and Marlis will be living with him, and Bob will be able to take care of her, and her daughter will be right there as well. Uh, so Marlis will be very close to her family. Uh, regarding hospitalizations and health concerns, Kathy Tordson's hip replacement surgery went very, very well. Uh, she was released from the hospital and she is recuperating at home. Uh, she'll have to wear a brace uh, for the next six weeks. Morris Sin was hospitalized pretty much all this week uh, with congestive heart failure and possibly a touch of pneumonia. Uh, he has since been released from the hospital and is now at the Chatfield Care Center uh, for the therapy that he needs to regain his strength. Uh, Jim Bailey, a member of congregation who was homebound for quite a while, is now residing at the Stewartville Care Center. And then we also pray for Nancy Henke. Uh, Nancy is, uh, as you know, at Seasons Hospice uh, in Rochester right now. Um, you are more than welcome to go and visit her. She'd be happy to have you visit. Uh, she can't talk in the sense of forming words, but she communicates quite well uh, through smiles and nods, and she is well aware of conversations that are happening around her and the people who are visiting with her, and she's very glad to have you come. And then uh, we are, have a prayer request for a Glenn Fine and Mike Fine. That's a father and a son. Uh, they're related to the Fines of our congregation. Also very close friends of Cindy Jensen. Glenn Fine and Mike Fine both have leukemia. In fact, they are both hospitalized right now in La Crosse. That's father and son. The son's in his 30s. Uh, the son was just diagnosed with very acute leukemia, and his therapies will begin tomorrow. Would you please stand for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for coming into this world to love us and care for us. You indeed bid us to wait on you, not in the sense that we just let time pass by, but rather that we trust you completely, trust you to fulfill your will in our lives and that you will do it at just the right moment in time. To that end, we pray that you help us to overcome our own selfishness, our reliance upon ourselves, and simply then to cast all of our cares and burdens on you, knowing that you truly love us and will deal with us in your time. So bless us, dear God, and help us to be faithful as we truly wait, wait for you. Continue to pour out your blessings upon these people that we name and those that we name in our hearts as well. For Kathy Tordson, as she's recovering from that surgery, we thank you. For Morris Sin, we pray for strength as he is at the Chatfield Care Center. For Jim Bailey, who is now residing at the Stewartville Care Center. For Walter Bannett and Dale Meldahl and Lyndon Luke and Nadalia Norgrant, we ask your blessing. For Glenn and Mike Fine, how difficult a situation when they are both hospitalized with rather severe forms of leukemia. We truly pray that medications will be effective and that the care that you, dear God, give to them will treat their leukemia successfully. Help them specifically to wait upon you, to trust, to trust in your unending love and that you will indeed bless them according to your will. Be also with Nancy Henke as she's at the Seasons Hospice at Gertrude Holzerland and Norm Schultz as they receive hospice care. May this time of waiting also be a very positive time of looking to you and receiving your blessings. And then we ask for your grace to be with Marlis Rosine as she's, she's moved to Baldwin. We truly pray that that be a, a good place for her where she is surrounded by her family and the love that they have for one another. Keep her in your care and help her to know that she still has her friends and home here at this place as well. We pray all this, dear Jesus, in your most blessed name. Amen. You may be seated. The offering is going to be received during the offering. If you've not yet signed the friendship registers, please do that. We're celebrating Holy Communion today, so check your communion attendance as well. Thank you.
And please stand for the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith, and above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives to us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he manifested to us when, by pouring out his precious blood, he saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, at his command, and with his own words, we receive the testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And you may be seated for the distribution. You may remain seated for the dismissal followed by the prayer for our country. Now may this body which is given for you and this blood which is shed for you strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. As we approach the celebration of Independence Day, let us come before our Lord in prayer for our nation. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. Establish justice. Ensure domestic tranquility. Provide for the common defense. Lord 
promote the general welfare. Secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. and any other things you would have us ask of you, O God, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And please stand for the blessing. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him.
thank you for being here. Sunday School and Bible class. Join us for that too, and then have a very wonderful and safe Independence Day celebration.